ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Want to join a film club that has real frank discussions, talking about films that you actually want to watch? Well, then look no further, because we are Frank Film Club with me, Maisie Williams. And each week we watch a film and then come together and obsess over it, or sometimes absolutely slate it. (laughs) Either way, there's always a lot to say. And the films that we pick range all the way from like 90s and noughties classics, all the way up to new releases that are coming out every single week. And sometimes we get our listeners to pick for us. And we all work in the film industry, don't we, ladies? Indeed. Um, So we really love to look at specifically how a film was made. So if this sounds like your bag, then come and have a listen to Frank Film Club. And remember, absolutely everyone is welcome in this club. Acast helps creators launch, grow and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com. I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you news from across Ukraine, discuss political and diplomatic updates from Central Asia and the Caucasus, and we delve into the details of the American aid bill to Ukraine. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 23rd of April two years and 60 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, editor of the Central Asia and South Caucasus Bulletin, James Kilner, and our guest is security columnist with The Insider, Colby Badwa. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. Welcome, Colby. So uh, over the last 24 hours, Russia has attacked five Ukrainian regions. Amazingly, only killed five, wounded a a dozen more at the moment, but remarkably small number, thankfully. Fifteen attacks said to have been launched against or throughout Donetsk Oblast. Also, Herzon was hit another 16 settlements in the region of in the south. The strikes down in Herzon reportedly damaged eight apartment buildings, 26 houses, an educational facility, a kindergarten, cultural institution, gas pipeline, a more critical infrastructure. Mikolaev and Sumy oblasts were also uh, hit with drones. In Sumy, the village there was shelled, so utterly shelling in Sumy. Now, in Kharkiv, a major television tower was, was destroyed yesterday, hit by several Russian rockets. Footage that you can find on social media show the antenna section, so the top, I guess, top third-ish, maybe half, half of the nearly 800-foot steel structure was hit, smashed to the ground, smoke billowing from it. Amazingly, no casualties, but I've not, uh, I've yet to see reports that any television services have been restored to to the Kharkiv region. We'll keep an eye on that. Elsewhere, Ukrainian officials were warning yesterday that up to 25,000 Russian soldiers are in position trying to take the Donetsk region city of Chasiv Yar. We've spoken about this numerous times over the last few weeks. This city is on high ground about 10 miles west of Bakhmut. seems to be the main focus of Moscow's offensive at the moment. We think they are trying to take it before May the 9th for a victory day, uh, the victory day parade in Moscow. Nazar Volishin, Ukrainian military spokesman, said Chasiv Yar is ours now. The situation around the city is difficult, but the city is under full control of our defence forces. There is no Russian army in the city. He said they were constantly storming. Russian forces were constantly storming positions held by Ukrainian forces, but without gaining any real foothold. Now, outside the uh, the country, Greece and Spain are under pressure, but they're not the only ones. They're under pressure to deliver Patriot air defence systems to Ukraine as, well, comparatively, they face very, very little attack right now, but they might do in the future. European Union ministers and officials are meeting in Luxembourg. They are, well, increasing the number of voices saying the EU bloc is going to have to 
to step up. Gabriel Landsbergis, Lithuania's foreign minister, who's always very, um, uh, very forthright with his, his comments. He's, um, you know, like like the Baltic states, they've been very clear eyed about the threat. Speaking to, re- to reporters last night, he said many al- allies will be relieved. There is good news coming from the United States, but it cannot stop us from doing what we have to do. At this point, we've dodged a historic bullet, but unfortunately, many more bullets are on the way. And therefore, we can be joyous for a day, but be prepared for the battle. There can be no coming down, no stopping of assistance and continue to to speak about how we are going to support Ukraine further still. Echo those comments. Now, asked whether European countries could relax their support for Kyiv, uh, Swedish Defence Minister Pal Jonsson replied, certainly not. We have to step up. This is absolutely crucial. The uh, discussions over air defence are likely to be the main issue on the agenda. That comes from a high-ranking senior EU official. And then Josep Borrell, EU's top diplomat, as he went into the, the first round of meetings, he said, we've been asking all member states to do whatever they can in order to increase the air defence capacity of Ukraine. So back to Greece and Spain. They are under particular pressure because they have patriot systems that many are saying could be spared for Kyiv without compromising the security of NATO. So Jens Stoltenberg, NATO's Secretary General, he said last week the alliance had carried out a review of its member states' air defence systems that could be used to protect Ukraine. And speaking last week, he said this mapping confirms that there are systems, including Patriot systems, to be provided to Ukraine. So pressure's mounting. Now, Madrid, Spain has a Patriot battery deployed in Turkey, where it's been stationed since 2013 to protect against missile attacks from Syria or any spillover of the the conflict there. And in 2020, Greek officials said they were considering sending one of their batteries to Saudi Arabia. Now, both Greece and Spain also have dozens of Soviet-era S-300 systems that could be offered. So in this, this sort of mounting pressure in the context of this pressure Pedro Sanchez the Spanish Prime Minister and his Greek counterpart Kyriakos Mitsotakis they were last week singled out by EU leaders in Brussels for for not not promising anything to Kyiv but challenged over whether Spain could offer patriots to Ukraine Foreign Minister Spain's Foreign Minister Jose Manuel Alvarez said that his government will make its decisions based on the power it has in its hands to support Ukraine He said, uh, I don't think we're helping if we can hear all the time what it is that's being given, when it's being given and how it's getting in. I mean, a fair point there. And you'll note that Italy were very clear in their policy of not being open about what was going to be sent. That's partly for domestic political reasons, I'm sure, but also partly with one eye to don't tell the Russians what's coming. You know, you can see both sides. So it's a fair point there for Mr. Alvarez. But if... Well, I just hope behind the scenes they're all, they're saying, come on in, Jose, where are the Patriots? Now, Ukraine, we think the best guess is currently has three Patriot systems, two supplied from the US, two from Germany, although Berlin promised a third last week. Uh, you may remember we reported on that. The Netherlands has also contributed launchers and missiles, but not the radar and control station elements that make up the entire system. And I've just seen a tweet just a couple of moments ago saying that there's been a deal struck with Spain to potentially make some parts of Patriot in Spain, which could unblock some of the uh, some of the uh, the sort of bottleneck there. So anyway, let's we'll keep an eye as you expect us to. We'll keep an eye on this EU meeting and any promises that come out of it. But promises that have been made in the last 24 hours, Britain's going to send another another aid package. Rishi Sunak, the prime minister, announced it last night. Uh, he unveiled another 500 million in extra equipment, including missiles and other other bits and bobs on top of the two and a half billion pledged for this year. So for the last two financial years, Britain pledged 2.3 billion. This year, they said it would be 2.5. This extra 500 obviously taking it up to, to 3 billion. So, you know, quite a, quite a lot. They've pledged to, um, the British MOD pledged to donate hundreds of armoured vehicles, 60 boats, including raiding craft that will be um, useful up and down the Dnipro, plus 4 million rounds of small arms ammunition to help Ukraine get through what uh, the MOD here describe as a difficult summer. Mr Sunak made this announcement ahead of a visit to Germany and Poland. He's going to urge European allies, as we've just been talking about, to increase military support. He's going to be speaking to all his counterparts, but in particular Olaf Scholz, Donald Tusk, 
Um, he's also going to visit British troops stationed in Poland and Germany. Now, before he travelled last night, he um, he was speaking to some journalists. He said Putin will not stop at the Polish border. And uh, Downing Street said the package was the single biggest donated in terms of both individual pieces of equipment and the breadth of weaponry covering land, sea and air. I think that's a little bit, you know, you're, you're looking for a... Uh, Looking for, I mean, it's a good package. You know, they don't don't really need to dress it up. I was interested. I was looking at this last night. We got the um, we got the notice of this from Number Ten, and it's embargoed, which is why it came out very late last night. It's in today's papers, and I was looking at it, and I was thinking, well, there's absolutely nothing there that couldn't have been pledged last week. It's not they're not waiting for the US to uh, to sign off on the sixty billion. This could have happened already. Very annoyingly, a little bit behind the Wizard of Oz curtain, if if you like. But I think it's more to do with how how domestic politics and the media agenda influence things. I think last week in Britain, the kind of news agenda that Number 10 wanted to push was all about the Rwanda bill. Those in this country will know what I'm what I'm talking about. And so there wasn't, on the grid of media management, there wasn't room for a big Ukraine announcement. That is annoying, that, but I'm afraid that's just the way the way democracies work. Anyway, what's it, what's in this package? More than 1,600 strike and air defence missiles. Also, Storm Shadow, obviously the long-range, high-precision missiles that uh, destroyed a Russian submarine in Sevastopol last September, I think. Ukraine's been using, against other signature pieces of Russian equipment. Sunak, again speaking last night, said, defending Ukraine against Russia's brutal ambitions is vital for our security and for all of Europe. Putin is allowed to succeed in this war of aggression. He will not stop at the Polish border. Ukraine's armed forces continue to fight bravely, but they need our support and they need it now. Well, they needed it last week as well, Prime Minister. Today's package will help ensure Ukraine has what they need to take the fight to Russia. Uh, what else do you say? Blah, 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 blah. UK at the forefront, all that kind of stuff you'd expect. Now, he also said, sorry, this is a spokesperson for, for the Prime Minister. He said, they have asked, that's Kiev, they have asked and we have answered. Yeah, okay, but timing is key here. And he said new weaponry, sorry, the spokesperson, new weaponry will be procured and delivered as quickly as possible. The UK continues to play a central role in European defence and security in the face of growing global threats threats and an expansionist Russia. I mean, yeah, all all correct, but I am a little bit miffed about the timing. Grant Shapps, British uh, Defence Secretary, he said this, what he calls a record package. I mean, it's big, but... Anyway, he said the record package would give Ukraine, quote, more of the kit they need to kick Putin out and restore peace and stability in Europe. I mean, yeah, okay, strong words. We will never let the world forget the existential battle Ukraine is fighting, and with our enduring support, they will win. The Prime Minister is also going to be he's going to be speaking to Donald Tusk about this offer to deploy RF Typhoon jets to Poland next year to help out with the NATO air policing mission. There's been an air policing mission since Russia's 2014 invasion of Ukraine, there's one in the Baltic, the Black Sea, it's Poland. There's also one up in, up in Iceland. Britain, we've normally done these rotations, four-month rotations in the Baltic and the Black Sea and Iceland. I think this is the first time the RF is actually deploying to Poland. I've been there on exercise, but I think this is actual one of NATO's air policing missions. I think this is the first time the Brits have been there, but there have been other... NATO members there since, like I say, since 2014. I spoke to a senior RAF source last night about this. And whilst, as we saw recently with the Iranian drones flying towards Israel, RAF Typhoon jets are capable of shooting down drones and missiles. I was emphatically told that is not what the mission is here. This is, quote unquote, normal air policing tasks. So just so NATO is not expecting even though we think there has been some spillover, missiles landing in Poland or certainly overflying Poland, Russian missiles. We think also Romania uh, or Moldova, certainly, and Romania possibly from some of the strikes Russia's been conducting against the ports on the Danube. Some of those missiles we think have landed inside Romania. But we don't think this NATO air policing mission is there to shoot these things down. It's just, the, as I say, normal air policing tasks that have been going on since 2014. However, it was stressed to me by the senior RAF source that if dro- Russian drones, missiles, what have you, entered Polish airspace, then the RAF typhoons would have the capability to engage them and bring them down. And I'm going to pause there, David, and dash off again because I've got to get back to my course. But I'll see you tomorrow. 
Well, thank you very much, Dom, for joining us and for talking us through all of those uh, updates. James Kilner, can I come to you? Let's dig into a couple of these stories and some of your own. Um, can we start in Chasiv Yar? You've been looking over the weekend at the fighting in the city, a crucial battle for Russia and Ukraine. What did you find? Hi, David. Yeah, so Chasiv Yar, I, th- I think this topic's fairly well covered. Um, uh, I was reporting on it for the Telegraph, as, as you say, and so in the Sunday paper, ahead of a few hours ahead of this critical vote. In the in in the U.S. House of Representatives, which uh, unlocked the sixty billion dollar military aid to, to to Ukraine. Now, the importance with this is that the the Ukraine defenders there are saying that they had been completely outgunned and that they were fighting uh, a crucial battle for the defence of of the way they framed it, the defence of that sector of the front line. Just a year lies about ten miles. West of Bakhmut, the, the the town the Wagner mercenary Kremlin's Wagner mercenary group captured last year, and it lies in the high, in high ground ten, ten miles west of Bakhmut, and about a dozen miles east to the east of the three or four larger towns lying in in, in river valleys below, which the Ukrainians sort of term describe as their fortress cities, and that the whole defence of that sector of the front line hinges on. And they say that Chasiv Yar is, is critical to defend these, uh, as a sort of buffer to these fortress cities. The latest news over the weekend from Chasiv Yar was that fighting intensified. Russian paratroopers had reached the edge of the town and were trying to battle through it. As usual, Russian military sending waves of these, these conscript prisoners who have been promised pardons after six month tour of duty in the front, on the front line, basically cannon fodder. Uh, and they're also dropping all these high explosive bombs, uh, new, new kit on uh, Ukrainian front lines. So really, it was it, it, the story was about um, the desperation of the, of the Ukrainian soldiers at this critical point ahead of the, the vote at the House of Representatives. Well, let's leave Ukraine then, James, and take us to Cameron in Central Asia, an interesting visit by the British Foreign Secretary. Why do you think that's relevant to what we're talking about? What does that show us? So your regular listeners... David will know I have a particular interest in Central Asia and I, and, I, and I try to bring it up when, when I can because I consider it an important sort of overflow of this conflict in, in Ukraine. Um, it is a sort of petri dish of how the world is polarising and, and fault lines are, are becoming. And C- Central Asia lies between China and Russia and Afghanistan and the Caspian Sea and is is sort of mineral rich, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been subjected to a lot of diplomatic pressure, economic pressure, business pressure from China over the the last few couple of decades. Uh, It's a former Soviet region, so it has very strong political, diplomatic, military links with with, uh, Moscow, et cetera. And the West has really struggled to maintain any consistent diplomatic and business interests in the region, with a few notable exceptions, and really struggled to make inroads which in ways to enable it to influence what's going on there. After the Afghanistan war, the, the drawdown in, in 2014, it really lost a lot of interest and momentum. Um, Cameron's visit is very important because it shows the UK upping its, its efforts to influence this region. He's the first foreign minister from Britain to visit Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan and Turkmenistan later this week. The first foreign minister to visit Uzbekistan since 1997. Kazakhstan is a semi-regular stop on British Foreign Secretary's overseas junkets as, as they lobby for mainly for the business, for business interests in, in Kazakhstan. But so, so Cameron's gone to, he's been in Dushanbe and Bishkek already and he's been meeting with Imam Ali Rahman, the president of Tajikistan and today uh, Sadeh Japarov, the president of Kyrgyzstan. Both Rachman and Japarov had initially voiced scepticism over Russia's war in, in Ukraine, in, in oblique terms, as oblique terms, as, as oblique as they can be. But it swung around more recently. And Cameron has talked about trying to win, wean them back to the, the Western viewpoint. In reality, it's not clear how much influence he's going to be able to have. Um, and there's also a very strong domestic agenda for Cameron to be out there. Brexit has created a labour shortage in, in Britain and, they're, they're, and, and the government's trying to import labour from Central Asia to plug, plug these gaps. Um, it also comes at a, at a sort of a, a... The optics are also a bit more complicated than this, David. It, 
Kyrgyzstan, for example, has been propping up Russia's economy through the Western sanctions. It's part of something called the Eurasian Economic Union, which is a sort of an economic group hints around the crowd. And, um, and has been buying in, and basically the, it's been buying in products which are banned from, which the West can no longer send directly to Russia. Been buying these products and then re-exporting them to, to Russia. Skipping around Western sanctions, really annoying policymakers in, in Washington and London, etc. For example, between March 22 and October 23, there was a 5,500% increase in German coal parts to Kyrgyzstan. And this has all been sent to Russia. So here you have Cameron, he's shaking hands with the president who's knowingly helping Russia. It's a very, very complicated optics. Last month too, the Kremlin, the Kyrgyzstan rather, passed something called a foreign agents law. It's a Kremlin inspired law, uh, which will crack down on Western aid to NGOs and media groups. Soros Foundation has already pulled out, said it's going to pull out of Kyrgyzstan, and several journalists have been arrested in Kyrgyzstan this year. So the optics of Cameron turning up in Bishkek and shaking hands with Japardov are very complicated. Thank you so much, James, for taking us through that. I, th- I think we have to do a sort of a bit of a tour de région at the moment. Let's, I mean, this is a story that we wanted to talk about. We re- really wanted to wait for you to be on because we know you're the best person really to speak about this. Armenia and Russia's uh, troops in Armenia, they're being moved. Why are they being moved? What's happening? And what does this mean for Ukraine? So there's, at, the, at the end of last week, the Kremlin uh, said that it ordered 2,000 so-called peacekeeper soldiers, which have been um, um, positioned in Nagorno-Karabakh, a disputed region between Armenia and Azerbaijan, to come home. Um, if, if you remember last September, there was a, a, a lightning-quick Azerbaijani assault on the sort of remaining bastion of, of ground held by pro-Armenian rebels around their, their capital, Stepanakert. There's a bit of fighting, but basically the Armenian rebels massively outgunned, surrendered, and about 100,000, 100, 120,000 ethnic Armenians fled the region into Armenia proper, sort of a very brutal, quick ethnic cleansing. Now, it, it seems now the Kremlin has decided that the optics are such that they can there now withdraw the, these 2,000 soldiers from nagorno karabakh and they've only been there since 2020, when there was another war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, they were there under a peace deal, their mandate was till 2025, and they're now going to withdraw those 2,000 soldiers and send them to the battlefields in Ukraine. This is important because, as we know, manpower in Ukraine has become an absolutely critical issue uh, in the war. And whereas Ukraine appears to be struggling to replenish its forces, Russia has been recruiting heavily from mainstream Russia, but also from the huge prison population it has, and other resources like these 2,000 so-called peacekeeper soldiers from the corner of Karabakh, which are professional soldiers. This sort of, in a, in a sort of, a, in a more sort of oblique fashion, this also um, highlights just how the Nagorno Karabakh issue has resolved itself in, um, in 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 a way that Kremlin and Baku are happy with, and Yerevan and its Western backers are, are increasingly uh, frustrated about. If we look at the South Caucasus in, in sort of more detail, we can see this hardening again of fault lines between the, the West and pro-Russia countries, namely Azerbaijan. Ilham Aliyev, the Azerbaijani president, was in the Kremlin yesterday speaking on speaking with, with Putin. Both men look very happy to see each other, very relaxed, etc., etc. Whereas Pachinian, Nikol Pachinian, the, the prime minister of, of Armenia, is, 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 uh, is basically persona non grata in, in the Kremlin at the moment. He wants to, to get much closer to the West. He wants to leave the Kremlin's military alliance. He signed deals with the EU. Last, the EU's promised 270 million euro, I think it was, to help uh, strengthen Armenian society against Russia. Uh, the US last week said it was going to help modernise our, 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 our Armenian military. Our Armenia's po- uh, posting a defence attaché in London, it's London Embassy. It's beefed up Lem- London Embassy for the first time. What we're seeing in the South Caucasus, David, is a sort of... I. I I don't think it's an over exaggeration to say it's an expansion of the sort of ten- of this growing tension which is coming from the war in Ukraine to the rest of the region, and we're really seeing it it, 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 it happening in a, in a very sort of strong way in, in the South Caucasus. 
Well, there's one more country, James. Thank you so much for all of that. One more country maybe to speak about, and that's Georgia. I think in, we've seen uh, in the news waves of protests in Tbilisi. Um, can you talk us through, I mean, again, this, this fits, in, fits, I think, into your thesis of the tensions and the, uh, the pulls and pushes and the drives of the war in Ukraine spilling out into the region. What is happening in Georgia? Yeah, exactly. It's again, it's this spillover from the Ukraine war and the hardening of this, of the of the pro-Russia versus pro-West uh, narrative. In, in in Georgia, it's a bit more. It's a bit it's, uh, that sort of tension is more ingrained. It's more long term. It's been going on for twenty years or more. If you remember, Russia and Georgia fought a war in two thousand eight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But since twenty twelve. The Georgia Dream, Georgia Dream has, this political party called Georgia Dream has dominated Georgian politics. It was set up um, bankrolled by a um, billionaire, Georgia's richest man, Benzina Ivanishvili, who made his billions in Russia in the 1990s. He's seen by some quarters very much as a pro Kremlin figure. Um, he had taken a back seat in Georgian politics. But he announced at the end of last year, just before New Year, that he was going to come back as executive chairman of the Georgia Dream. At the time, he said this was to prevent Georgia Dream government ministers falling to temptation of very obscure terminology, etc. But it came a few days after the EU, or a couple of weeks rather, after the EU had made Georgia a candidate member state for EU uh, membership, etc. Um, so, so, so the timing wasn't lost on anyone. Um, uh, last, uh, early this month rather, um, uh, the Georgian Green government took everyone by surprise and said they're going to try and reintroduce a law which got, which they abandoned last year after street level clashes between protesters and police, um, which was again this so-called foreign agents law that I was talking about earlier in Kyrgyzstan. Um, it's Kremlin-inspired law, which has been used in Russia to crimp the activities of Western-backed NGOs and Western-backed media. Um, again, this has triggered street demonstrations. We haven't seen major clashes, although we've seen police chase off demonstrators with pepper sprays, etc., etc. The president of Georgia, um, uh, Zurabashvili, she is she, she was a one-time semi-ally of the Georgian Dream. She's come out strongly against it uh, and and is calling the Georgian Dream the Russia Dream now. G- Georgia has 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 stayed out of this war. It hasn't picked any sides, surprising people. Um, there's a real feeling in Georgia that the Georgian Dream government is trying to line the country up more increasingly uh, behind the Kremlin. Uh, and that is worrying a lot of people. And, and I think we're seeing real, real tension in Georgia and uh, bubbling to the surface. Again, this has all come from the, 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 the exaggerations um, triggered by, by this war in Ukraine. So, so again, something for your listeners to watch out for. Well, James, that was splendid. I mean, we've gone from the Central Asian states to the Caucasus. Uh, brilliant stuff. Thank you so much, James Kilner, and before James, Dom Nichols. Um, it's a great pleasure to wel- welcome uh, Colby Badwa. Colby, thank you so much for joining us. Just before we get into the questions, would you just like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me on. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, I'm Colby Badwa. I'm a security columnist for The Insider, which is a Russia-focused publication that does a lot of uh, investigative work. You may have seen some stories by Michael Weiss and Christo Groza. They do a lot on investigating the activities of uh, Russian intelligence in, in Europe and recently collaborated with 60 Minutes on a big piece on uh, Havana Syndrome. Um, so that, that's who I write for. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you on. Let's start then just by looking at the American Ukraine aid bill passed in the House on Saturday. Um, for you, what are the big takeaways from what we saw? Sure. So it's it's certainly been long awaited legislation. So it's good to see it finally pass. Mm-hmm. My my main takeaway, though, is I'm a little bit disappointed that it isn't quite going as far as it needs to go in terms of the amount of assistance that it's going to provide to Ukraine and the amount of uh, money that's also going to be available for the U.S. Department of Defense investments in the defense industrial base and, and money to buy replacement equipment for all the things that are getting sent to Ukraine. There's some significant shortcomings there, which uh, are certainly going to impact the amount of assistance that can be provided to Ukraine over the long term. So that's a problem that uh, is on the horizon, perhaps even closer than a lot of people might think. Um, But certainly in the short term, Ukraine is going to get some more security assistance from the United States, which certainly they need very badly because 
things on the front line are not very good. As was previously mentioned earlier on, on the show, the Russians are continuing to advance on a number of different axes. So Ukraine needs more ammo to uh, start repelling those attacks. Let's dig into that then. You say significant shortcomings in some aspects. What are they? And what's the timeline here, do you think? Sure. So to answer that, just like kind of a brief overview of how U.S. security assistance to Ukraine actually functions. The main mechanism by which that occurs is called Presidential Drawdown Authority, which is a provision in the Foreign Assistance Act, Section 506 to be specific, which allows the president to direct the drawdown of defense articles or defense services from the stocks of the Department of Defense to international partners. So that's equipment, it's ammunition, it's all the tanks, the armored vehicles, all the stuff that the United States or most of the stuff that the United States is providing to Ukraine, it flows through that authority. So that authority by default is capped at $100 million per fiscal year for every country in the world combined. So it's not a large amount of authority that's provided to the president. So Congress on four, now five occasions has increased that cap, that which is a cap on the monetary value of all that equipment and increased it so that the president has a lot more flexibility to send that equipment and that ammunition to Ukraine. So in this bill, that number has been set at $7.8 billion. So $7.8 billion worth of equipment, ammunition can be sent from DOD stocks to Ukraine. And it's just not, it's not a very large number in the grand scheme of things. It's, it's not going to go as far, it's not going to allow as much ammunition to go to Ukraine as Ukraine really needs, because Ukraine has quite significant needs. The military still is, they're obviously very short in ammunition, so there's a lot of ground to be caught up on. And then we have to consider what are the long-term needs for Ukraine over the next six, eight, 10 months, stretching potentially into the next, past next presidential election, because personally, I'm a little bit skeptical that there's going to be any more uh, aid appropriations passed before then. So this bill has a fairly long period of time that needs to cover off. And I'm I'm just concerned that that $7.8 billion is not a large enough number to get uh, Ukraine to that point. And looking at the contents of the bill, what, what do you think are the more, most important pieces of it that will do the most for the Ukrainians when it is signed through and, and goes off to Ukraine? So that PDA cap is certainly the most important aspect. Um, as I said, most of the assistance that the United States is providing to Ukraine flows through that. There's been about $20 billion over the past two years that the United States has committed to Ukraine through presidential drawdown authority. So there's never 7.8 to add to that. So Ukraine will certainly be able to get a lot of ammunition through that mechanism, but as I said, probably not nearly as much as they need. Um, so there's that other important appropriation in the bill, actual money is called the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, which is a a large chunk of money, it's $13.8 uh, billion in this in this bill. That allows the Department of Defense to go out and place contracts to procure new equipment for Ukraine that doesn't yet exist. That's things that are not in their own stockpile, so they can place orders with American defense companies or even international defense companies. The United States has placed orders for ammunition from Bulgaria for Ukraine with that money before. Most of it flows back to the United States, but there's an opportunity there, and, and this is quite important, that those funds can be used by President Biden to fund the Czech initiative or the Estonian initiative, because those initiatives are certainly not yet fully funded as far as we've been told. So that money could be used to buy this ammunition that is available apparently on the international market. So that could be another tool to get much needed artillery ammunition to Ukraine relatively quickly. Colby, you've been looking at American assistance and funding of Ukraine for, well, for, for a very long time now. What kind of misunderstandings or myths do you encounter from people looking at it? Because it's an intensely sort of tricky subject to talk about. You, you, you talk about it very fluently and engagingly. But what, what, do you, what would you want the public, the general public, to understand about how this all works? What do you think we maybe still do not understand? Oh, geez, I don't know where to start. Yeah, I mean, I've been talking about it basically for almost the entire war. And still two years in, there's a, a whole lot of misunderstanding about how the process actually works, what the legal authorities are, what the actual funding mechanisms are, and, and how they all interface. So I wrote a thread, very long thread, over 100 tweets long, which certainly uh, some people balked at, but it's, it is a very complicated topic. 
and an awful lot actually got left out of that thread as well. Could have been even longer, but I wrote a lengthy thread kind of explaining a lot of the those key questions and trying to help people understand how it works better. But even just with this latest bill, I'm seeing so much misinformation uh, put out about what's in the bill. I see a lot of people saying that it's a a bill of $60 billion in military aid to Ukraine, which it is not. It is roughly a bill with $60 worth of appropriated money in it, but it's not $60 billion going to Ukraine, certainly not $60 billion worth of military aid going to Ukraine. There's um, a lot of humanitarian and, and economic assistance in the in the bill as well. It's not all military, and Ukraine certainly is not getting anything close to $60 billion worth uh, of anything out of the bill. A lot of the money actually goes um, to the Department of Defense for things that are really not related to Ukraine at all. So that's this whole latest uh, episode with with the aid, new aid bill has demonstrated that there's still a whole lot of um, misunderstanding. So uh, I still have a lot of work cut out to try and help people understand how the, how the process works. Well, thank you so much, Colby. One more question from me before I know that James also has a question. What happens now? You, you, you've obviously been, as you said, reporting on this for, for years. What should we expect to happen in the next few weeks? How quickly does all this stuff get over? And you've half mentioned it, but do you think that this is really the last sort of package of assistance before the presidential ele- election? Sure. So we're, we're waiting for the Senate to um, vote on the bill. They're supposed to be starting today with the first procedural vote, and then there'll be some other votes probably to happen before they can have a, a final vote on passage of the legislation. And then it goes to President Biden for his signature. And all of the reporting and all the statements out of the White House seem to be that as soon as President Biden signs the bill, he's going to authorize a new drawdown authority package for Ukraine. And as soon as he he signs that and he has to submit a, um, a notification to Congress informing them that he's using his Section 506 drawdown authority powers, then the United States military can start executing that drawdown and uh, and delivering the stuff, the equipment to Ukraine. And there's been lots of reporting that there are a number of things that have already been pre-positioned in Europe and then are, are ready to go. So conceivably, and we know in past cases that assistance, drawdown authority assistance has gone to Ukraine within a matter of hours of the actual decision um, being signed and, and submitted to Congress. But for other items, it might take days or weeks, depending on if it still has to be shipped from the United States. Some things go over by plane. If they're air transportable, other things that are too large and heavy, they have to go by boat. So it really depends on what, what President Biden decides to send. There's been some reporting that there's going to be more armored vehicles, certainly more artillery ammunition, more air defense interceptors. So I would expect that some of that's going to start flowing into Ukraine pretty much immediately. But for some of the things like some of the new armored vehicles, those might take a little bit longer. Well, Colby, thank you so much for asking all of my questions. James Kilner, I know that you have a question. Hi, Colby. That's really, really interesting and really useful. I, I was puzzling over the, the, the minuto of the, the bill on Sunday. A couple of questions from me. How does this military aid bill, in terms of numbers, how does it compare to other tranches of US military aid, that it's other military aid given by the US to Ukraine, in terms of the actual amount of military assistance in the kit? You, you were talking about the breakdown. It doesn't mean that all 60 billion is going to become military kit. I was wondering if this is bigger or less or the same as previous tranches. And linked to that, I was also, I'm also interested in, it seems to me that the war has potentially got more expensive to to prosecute now in 2024 than it was, say, in 2022. Because of the attritional nature of the war, you need more shells, you need more missiles, you need more men, that sort of thing. Um, uh, is that something you've looked at? And finally, and I don't want to spread malicious rumour in any way, but there was a report which was quoted on some Brussels-based news agency over the weekend, which came initially out of TASS, a Russian news one, saying that the US had, one of the reasons the US had approved the bill or voted it through, was because they were linking it to Ukraine bolstering their recruitment drive. Is that, have you heard anything about that or, or do you know anything about that? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So uh, on the last question first, in general, I uh, don't take things coming out of task too, too seriously. But I, I have not heard really of any linkage between the aid bill and recruitment in Ukraine. Certainly, I think that those are both very important issues. But I, I, 
that linkage is not something that I've seen come up in the discourse in the United States. As for the the so the first question, how does it compare to the previous aid bills? So in the prior bill that was passed at the very beginning or very end of 2022 into 2023, um, Congress passed the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2023 and include that was funding for the whole U.S. government for fiscal year 2023. And included in that bill was an additional aid appropriation for Ukraine that had 14.5 billion in drawdown authority, so almost double the amount that's being included in this bill. So that's a obviously a much better number because it's even that though, in my view, it's still probably a little bit short of what Ukraine really needs. But I, I would have been much happier with that number on the same on the same scale of the last bill. So. This bill certainly is is less in that regard. There's a lot of different numbers, so some may be higher, some may some may be lower. I'm actually going to be publishing a new thread shortly, uh, doing a, a line item audit of this bill, explaining everything that's that's in it, uh, so people can see all those numbers. So stay tuned for that. But uh, in general, there's definitely some sh- significant shortcomings with this bill compared to the most recent one prior. And then, sorry, remind me of your middle question there. It was whether you knew whether the war would become more expensive to, to prosecute, i.e. does the money run out quicker because of the attritional nature of, of, of the war and, and how uh, it seems to me there's a lot more kit is needed, a lot more men are needed. Yes, excellent question. This is absolutely the case. The same way that it's it's much cheaper to just deter a war from happening altogether than to fight a war is. If Ukraine had been provided with a lot more assistance early and up front, then this would this could have been achieved for far less both blood and treasure than it's going to require now. Two years of war. So many Ukrainian soldiers have been killed. So many Ukrainian civilians have been killed. Ukraine has suffered so much damage from just the unrelenting Russian aerial bombardments. And none of that really had to happen if collectively all of our, all of the countries here that are supporting ukraine we had decided that we weren't really going to place all of these arbitrary limits on what we were willing to provide ukraine because we're, we're actually we're all familiar with all of these sagas of oh this weapon system whatever excuse it, it was at the time it's too complicated for ukraine they can't understand it or it's too escalatory russia is going to retaliate and, and escalate to uh weapons of mass destruction if we send this or that we just can't do it. And we've seen over the course of two years that basically all of these concerns have been completely unfounded. Everything that we thought we couldn't give for one reason or another turned out that those excuses were basically just our own leaders deterring themselves without really any grounds. And all of the people uh, who've been advocating for Ukraine to have a lot more support and ha- not having any of these um, key weapon systems off limits, if those have been delivered to Ukraine, then things would look very different on the ground right now, I, I believe. If we didn't have President Biden refusing to send long-range missiles, we didn't have him refusing to send armored vehicles for a full year, if, if Chancellor Scholz hadn't been refusing to provide tourist missiles, if Patriot missiles had been provided to Ukraine right, right off the get-go, and new Patriot batteries ordered for Ukraine as well, then certainly Ukraine could be in a much better, stronger position right now. And it would have cost less money as well, actually, in, in the long run, because uh, every additional month that goes by, it's just going to require more and more financial commitment from us to continue to support them between the military assistance they need and the humanitarian, the economic aid that they need to keep their country uh, on life support. Uh, Colby, that was really interesting. Thank you very much. But, but, but does the actual uh, cost of sustaining the front line now, is it a lot more expensive than, say, it was in 2022 in terms of resources that it requires to keep the front line steady because Russia is able to throw so many artillery shells and, and men at the front line. Yeah, certainly their war making capacity has increased over two years. At, at the get go, we saw the sanctions had an impact on their ability to produce the weapons they needed, but fairly quickly they figured out how to circumvent those and Russian production has continued to rise. So. The Russians are much better equipped today and they're getting stronger and they're drafting more and more personnel. And Ukraine, as I said, they have a, a manpower problem and 
but the issue of mobilization in Ukraine is certainly a, a bit of a controversial domestic political topic. So certainly Ukraine needs a lot more help from us because Russia is gaining in strength and and Ukraine needs more material to make up for some other shortcomings that their military has. Uh, so it, it is actually, it is absolutely getting more expensive for us to enable Ukraine to fight back success, successfully against the Russians at this point in time. Thank you so much, Colby, for your time and your answers. Thank you so much, James, for your questions there. Coming up, we hear James and Colby's final thoughts. Let's move then to our final thoughts. Uh, James Kilner, would you like to go first? So a uh, couple from me, David. Well, your listeners might recall yesterday, um, Ramzan Kadyrov's health is back on the news agenda. Um, it popped up last summer, I think. Uh, Nova Gazeta, a Russian newspaper, a sort of liberal-minded Russian newspaper, published what they described as an investigation, saying they had some sort of pancreatic disease. A few hours later, the, the, the Chechen... Uh, regime released a video of Kadyrov apparently hosting a, a meeting with his main minister, etc. But in this in this video, he looked completely monosyllabic. He was his eyes were glazed over, and he was staring down at his briefing paper, not really saying anything. So that again, is part of the conversation of, for Russian watchers. This is important because Kadyrov has been a massive p- p- proponent of Putin's war in Ukraine. And he is bankrolled massively by the Kremlin to keep a lid on any potential trouble in Chechnya, which is a sort of a rebellious state in the south of, of Russia. So if the Kremlin has to deal with some sort of succession issue, problems down there, that is a potential Achilles heel for Putin. So something for your listeners to watch out for. The last thing I, I just want to, um, to, to, to flag up is a really sad footage yesterday seeing the TV town Kharkiv be destroyed. And it reminded me of an interview in Konsomolska Pravda, a Moscow-based newspaper that Sergei Lavrov gave over the weekend, in which he became, I think he was the first senior criminal official since 2022, to list Kharkiv as a target for the Russian army. So we're seeing obviously a very confident Russian army and worryingly naming Kharkiv again as, as a target for its military. The shooting of the destruction of this TV tower, a reminder of that. So something again for your listeners to be aware of. Absolutely. Thank you so much, James, for joining us today. Colby, as our guest, would you like the very final words? Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, the key thing I'm looking at going forward is just now that the a bill uh, is going to pass imminently in the United States uh, that President Biden fought very hard to get. Is he going to make full use of the uh, authority being given to him and deliver Ukraine uh, long range attack weapons and other other key weapons that the Ukrainians have been asking for a very long time now? Because I, 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 their prospects are not great if there's uh, all these arbitrary limits still imposed on, on these systems that they're allowed to receive. So that's a key question for me going forward. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And, if you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.
ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hey folks, it's Mark Marin from WTF. I've been talking to all kinds of famous people in my garage since 2009, including a sitting president. You know, I, I don't imagine you were flying in here on the chopper thinking like, you know, I, I am nervous about Mark. No, I wasn't. Okay, well, that's good. That okay. would be a problem. It would be a problem. If the president was feeling yeah. stressed about it. <laughs> coming to my garage. Coming to your garage. And now there's even more WTF when you subscribe to the full Marin to get weekly bonus content and all WTF episodes ad-free. Listen to WTF wherever you get podcasts and subscribe to the full Marin at go.acast.com slash WTF. ACAST helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. ACAST.com. <laughs>